Hey YouTube, welcome back to an inclusive cycling channel where you can join the fun by grabbing your bike and going out there for a bike ride and we're gonna save the world together. And if you make a YouTube video about your adventure or let me know what you get up to in the comments, that would be really, really cool. I'd love to hear about it. Today's video is part one of a bike building series. This is my winter project. And basically I'm going to be building a touring bike. Actually, I'm calling it a modern touring bike. So the bike I'm building is a Fairlight Ferran 2.0. And in this video, I'm gonna go through some of the specifications of this frame, the kind of bike I'm looking to build. And I'm also gonna talk about some alternatives because I've been planning this build for about a year. I ordered the frame about a year ago. And since then, some other bike frames and bikes that fit the same sort of design philosophy that I'm looking for have come on the market. So I'm gonna to talk to you about those because if I was doing this again now at the end of 2021, I would probably go for something a little bit different, but I'll talk you through all that in this video. Hope you enjoy. Thanks for watching. Okay, so this is a Fairlight Ferron 2.0 steel framed touring slash adventure bike. And I'm really building it up more as a touring bike. I wanna take it to Europe and cycle around there. I'd love to cycle around North America as well. And in the future, maybe I'll be able to do some tours to more obscure locations as well, but I'm really not building it for off-road adventures, although this frame is perfectly capable of handling that sort of use. So my design choices kind of reflect how I'm gonna be using the bike. However, I really want to build a modern touring bike because most touring bikes are still built um, with a lot of older technology, I would say. And the thinking behind that is that if you get to some obscure country and you have a mechanical failure, you are more likely to be able to find the parts. So what I mean by that is things like 26 inch wheels, uh, steel frames, um, and quick releases, things like that. Also cable operated brakes, whether you have rim brakes or disc brakes. And I just don't think those kind of bikes are as much fun to ride. And I also, I'm also not sure I agree with them being more reliable. So the main thing I was looking for in a frame set when I was shopping was the through axles, the front and rear through axles, which this has. This has the standard uh, gravel bike and road bike through axle sizes, 12 by 142 millimeter in the back, 12 by 100 millimeter in the front. It's exactly the same as my Pinnacle gravel bike. And my thinking behind that is that I really just really like the way they work. Your wheel is always gonna be centered. You're gonna be able to use disc brakes very effectively. And I also personally think they're more reliable, even though a lot of people disagree with me. And the reason for that is that I've personally broken uh, two quick releases and I've seen so many bikes with bent quick release axles. Uh, and I've never had a problem with a through axle. I have heard of problems with through axles, but I think the reliability of a through axle system is so much better than a quick release. I just, it's one of those things that I would, I would never purposely buy a bike that used a quick release unless it was something really specialized, like maybe uh, a hub gearing system or a fixie, something like that. Um, but for most people and most situations, I would just really go for through axle. Um, and I'm not really sure I buy into the argument of the quick release being more reliable, although it probably is more available. The other thing I'm looking for in a modern touring bike frame is the ability to use disc brakes, in particular hydraulic disc brakes. This is another area where I don't really agree with people who say you need to have cables because a lot of touring bikes now have cable operated disc brakes and cables will stretch first of all, and they're also prone to braking. Whereas hydraulic hoses are, they really are very, very reliable. They're very simple and very reliable. And sure, any system can fail, but with brakes, you always have two. You have your front brake and your back brake. And the effectiveness and the feel of the brakes is so much better with hydraulic disc brakes that I just don't wanna compromise on that. And I certainly wouldn't wanna go for any sort of rim brakes. The final thing that I'm looking for in a modern touring bike frame is a one by gearing setup. This is something that I'm less convinced about. I really like the one by system from mountain bikes. Like I've got my Pinnacle Iraco back there with the one by mountain bike drive frame. They're ubiqui ubiquitous on mountain bikes these days. 
They are pretty common on gravel bikes as well. Most touring bikes use uh, triple crank sets, uh, triple, triple chain, chain sets or doubles. Um, but I really wanted to try the one by system. Um, I'm not as convinced that this is such a good idea, but I do want to try it. And that's the main thing that makes my particular build unique. I'm not going to talk about it too much in this video, but I will make some videos where I talk about the drivetrain and how I solve the challenge, the challenges of getting enough range and also getting a, no, a low enough gear because most off the shelf one by systems for gravel bikes and road bikes uh, don't have a low enough gear uh, for touring or even as a mountain bike type use. Um, so those are kind of the three things that I was looking for in buying a modern touring bike frame set. Now, since I planned out the drivetrain, I have learned a little bit more about drivetrains in general. And there are some negatives to the one by setup that I will mention uh, now, obviously, you're gonna have issues with your chain line and getting the, the right amount of gears, things like that. Those are some things that I think the newest technology and my particular setup will address. But one thing that certainly is true is that you will have more wear on your chain ring if you have a one by system simply because there's only one chain ring. Whereas if you have a triple, triple, triple chain set, your wear is going to be uh, broken up across those three different chain rings. So each ring will wear less. It's kind of like having winter tires for your car where you use each set of tires half as much. The only thing with that is on my bike tours that I've done in the past, I've almost always only used the smallest chain ring. So I'm not sure how much that will apply in my case, but that is certainly something to be aware of. But I really wanted to try the one by system. And that is something I'll get into a bit more in a future video. There's at least one other disadvantage to using a one by system on a touring bike that I can think of. And that is that, as far as I know, all of the 1x12 speed mountain bike drivetrains out there use proprietary bottom brackets. So I'll go ahead and tell you that I'm going to be using a Praxis Works bottom bracket, and it actually uses a separate tool on the right side and the left side. And it's the same story for Shimano. The new Shimano 12 speed uh, mountain bike drivetrains all use different tools depending on exactly which groups that you get, which I actually have a video about if you're interested in that. But that means that you might not be able to find these tools in all countries and maybe not every mechanic will have those tools available. And the thing with bottom brackets is you're probably not going to be able to service them yourself because you're going to have to carry spare parts and the tools um, unless you're really going on an expedition, in which case you may want to consider doing that. Um, but these tools may be more difficult to find in other countries. And if you contrast that with a standard square taper bottom bracket, which is what a lot of touring bikes still use, and it's very, very common, you're going to be able to find the tools for that pretty much anywhere. It's just like the 26 inch wheels. You're going to find 26 inch wheels anywhere. And that is definitely a potential uh, disadvantage of the one by system. Um, I'm not sure how the reliability is though. I'm not sure how um, that varies between the square taper and the modern bottom brackets. Uh, and there is a plus, which is that you don't really need tools to take out the crank set. Whereas with the uh, square taper cranks, you need a crank puller. Although I think there are certain ones that don't need a puller. Um, so I guess it's kind of, it goes both ways. There's pluses and minuses to everything. And in this day and age, you can obviously always get something sent to you, although it might take six, six weeks to get there. Um, but it's certainly something to think about. And since I kind of planned this bike out, it's, it's something that's been on my mind a bit. Like how would I manage that if I did go on a tour to a, um, a really obscure sort of a country? I don't think it's really gonna be a problem just going around Europe and North America, but that is something that's on my mind. Or do you take the tools with you? And if you take the tools, do you then take another bottom bracket? Because if you did that, you could just service it yourself. Um, but that is another potential disadvantage of the one by system on a touring bike like this. All right, now let me talk to you a little bit about some other options that fit this design idea I have of a modern touring bike. And I can tell you right now that if I was doing this again now, which is the end of 2021, I would almost certainly buy a Kona Sutra frame set, maybe even a used one. The main reason for that is the Kona Sutra costs $600 as a frame set, and this was about $1,100, so almost twice as expensive. And you're not getting twice the bike in this frame set. I can tell you that right now. They're, they're very, very similar. They're both uh, steel 
frame touring bikes. They both have steel forks. Uh, they both have the through axles and the geometry is very similar as well. Um, I think this bike looks a little bit better, but it's not worth the $500. I didn't know about the Kona, but I didn't look into it. Um, and that's probably my own bias because I had a Kona Sutra about 12 years ago and I didn't really get on with it that well because I didn't like the brakes. They were those cable disc brakes I'm talking, I was talking about earlier, although that isn't, isn't really an issue in this case. And the bike I bought didn't fit me either. The dealer sold me a bike that wasn't fitted to me. So I had to sell it on and it kind of put a bad taste in my mouth, but that's not Kona's fault. So in 2021, knowing that the bike now has through axles, that's almost certainly the frame set I would go for. But there are a couple other options out there. When I was thinking about this project, and I've been thinking about it for about two years, the bike I was actually gonna buy was a Trek 920. Uh, the main reason I didn't is because I think it's actually discontinued now, but the Trek 920 is different because it's an aluminum framed bike, uh, which doesn't bother me at all. Some people really like the steel, the aluminum doesn't bother me at all. But as I got ready to buy a frame, the price had kind of gone up and then it just wasn't available anywhere. So I'm, I'm pretty sure it's discontinued, but I'm glad I didn't buy it because the Trek 920 has different geometries. It's, it's a much longer bike and I'm quite short in the tor torso, but long in the legs. And a bike like that wouldn't have really fit me very well. I think this is gonna be a much better fit for me. Another bike I was looking at was the Pipe Dreams Alice. This Fairlight Ferran is made in England, by the way, and so is the Pipe Dreams Alice. They are very similar. The geometry is quite similar, but the Pipe Dreams Alice is a little bit less expensive. It's a few hundred dollars less. Um, and the other main difference is that this bike is available in a ton of sizes, like 12 sizes. And the Pipe Dreams Alice was only available in four. There is a size that would have fit me, but when I was getting ready to order, that one wasn't available either. So with this bike, I was on a wait list for, I wanna say about eight months. And when I ordered this bike, the Pipe Dreams wasn't available and it's still not available. So just not a very available bike. That's the main reason I didn't go for that, but that would be another strong contender. Um, the Pipe Dreams Alice also, I think it had the 12 millimeter through axe on the back, but it had a 15 millimeter in the front, I think. Um, so kind of an unusual size. So it might be a, a little bit more difficult to find a um, wheel that fits it. I think it was even a 15 millimeter by 100 millimeter uh, front hub, which is kind of unusual. Uh, and then the other bike that I found, about, found out about more recently is the, I always get this wrong, is it the Breezer Radar X or the Radar, Radar X Breezer? I think it's a Radar X Breezer. And that bike is quite different in the geometry department. It's another one of the longer and lower ones like the Trek 920 was. Um, and it's really built like a mountain bike. That one has the boost spacing in the back. It has the 48 millimeter spacing in the back, the 110 millimeter spacing in the front, um, but it looks like a gravel bike or a touring bike, just like this one does. Also steel framed, and that bike is insane value. So if you wanna buy an off the shelf, um, sort of modern touring bike, I would take a very, very hard look at that because it's about, I think it's about um, $1,700, something like that. And that's insane value because all the parts are name brand. It has FSA bearings. It has a SRAM Apex drivetrain. Um, WTB tires, maybe they skimmed out on the wheels somehow, but just glancing through, through the specs, I really couldn't see where they skimmed out. So the um, Radar X Breezer is another insane value bike, not available as a frame set. I didn't know about it when I bought this and the geometry is a little bit different, but if you're looking for something off the shelf, I don't think you can go wrong with that bike at all just because of the price. So those are some of the alternatives, but I ended up with this Fairlight and like I said, this is, is quite expensive. It's actually very, very expensive. Um, you know, the color is amazing. This thing is handmade in England. Um, and I hope it fits me. And it has a lot of the um, things I'm looking for again. So I'm really excited about it. Don't think there's that much else to say. This has a straight one and an eighth inch steer tube, which I think a lot of the steel or maybe all the steel framed bikes have. 
um, which is a little different from your modern mountain bikes and road bikes, but this includes the fork. By the way, the fork's there. We might unbox that in a sec. Another thing this bike has, which is kind of weird, is it has a integrated derailleur hanger, a steel derailleur hanger there. I'm not sure if all steel bikes have that. I guess the thinking there is if you crash, um, you would break your derailleur because your derailleur is going to be softer than the frame. Whereas with an alloy bike, you're going to have a separate derailleur hanger and the derailleur hanger is a sacrificial piece, but a little weird because then you're sacrificing your derailleur, but maybe that's normal. And I guess there's very little risk of that becoming unaligned. So that's another cool thing about the Fairlight, but I'm very excited about it. Going to do some, some build videos about this bike and um, hope you enjoy. Maybe we'll just take a quick look at the fork there because I have it. I haven't actually unboxed it yet. So I'll get it out and show you the fork now. All right, before I get into the fork, I just forgot to mention two things. One is the fit of this bike. So um, a good thing about Fairlight, and maybe one thing that kind of helps justify the cost, is that they offer a lot of sizes. They do this thing called proportional sizing, and you can get each frame size in a tall and in a regular. So mine is a 56 tall, and the geometry is actually very, very similar to my uh, Pinnacle Arcos gravel bike. And the way I arrived at the, uh, the frame size here uh, is that I actually used the online calculator which Fairlight has made available. So you put in your height, your wingspan, and your inseam, and your gender, and it gives you a recommended bike frame size. And then later on, I found out that you can also give them the a geometry of your current bike, and then they will spec out a frame to match. And I did that, and it both in both cases, it came out at 56 tall. And um, that kind of makes sense because I always talk about how I'm kind of tall and kind of have long arms, so the tall frame size kind of makes sense. And I'm really happy that both of those methods came out with the same frame size. And if you buy a Fairlight, there's a good chance you're going to get a frame that fits because they do offer so many different sizes. So that's a good thing about Fairlight. Another thing that I wanted to mention before I get into the fork is that this type of bike is really distinct from a gravel bike. It kind of looks like a gravel bike and there is some crossover there, but I already said it's different from a touring bike because of the through axles and stuff like that. But it's also different from a gravel bike and the main reason is because of the fork. So this bike is gonna have a steel fork and gravel bikes almost always have carbon fiber forks. And the geometry might be a bit different as well, but the main thing with the carbon fiber is that you won't be able to use a front rack. There is one fork I know about that allows you to use a front rack. It's the Rodeo Labs Spork. That fork itself is like 500 bucks. Um, and I don't think that you can even put that much weight on that fork, but a steel fork is gonna allow you to use a traditional rack and traditional panniers, and that's what I wanna do. I really like the idea of the bike packing and I have tried it um, and it does free up your bike, but I'm just not enough of a minimalist on the bike to be able to do that over long distances. Um, I wish I was, but I really wanted to build this as a touring bike and that's kind of what I've done here. Um, so it is, it really is quite different from a gravel bike, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Um, but I do think that this type of bike will become more prevalent. There already are more and more bikes coming out like this. Even since I bought this frame, like I said, bought it a year ago, probably started planning two years ago, but now we have that Breezer Radar X, um, you know, the, uh, what else is out there? The Pipe Dreams Alice and some other stuff like that. So there is more coming on the market now. Um, and we'll see, maybe this kind of bike will take off, but that's kind of what I wanted to say. Let's go check out that fork now. All right, let's unbox this fork real quick. I've actually already opened it. The reason for that is that I practiced what I was gonna say in this section about 20 times already. So I've opened it and closed a couple times. Um, just like with the fork, that actually took about an hour of filming as well, plus a couple of weeks of pacing up and down and deciding what I was gonna say. Anyway, um, let's just open up this package and see what we got. So the first thing is that I actually found my invoice here and I can tell you that this bike actually cost me 920 pounds shipped to the US, which is 1200 bucks. So it is twice as expensive as the Kona Sutra. So really, honestly too expensive, uh, but it is what it is. Um, and that will be even more in the UK because that comes out more expensive than shipping to the US, which is kind of crazy. Um, but we can get rid of that. 
We've got a bunch of uh, screws and fittings in here. I'm not sure exactly what all of it is, but I know that some of it is going to be the uh, cable guides. We've got um, some uh, cable protective things, and we probably have the plugs for the uh, internal cable routing as well, but I'll deal with that later. And then there's a big box here that says made in Taiwan, which kind of surprised me because the bike frame is handmade in England, um, but it's not a problem from the point of view of quality because most bike frames and forks are made in Taiwan and these manufacturers just buy those components from a supplier. So I guess Fairlight is doing the same thing. Um, it just is another area where it just kind of shows that the bike is honestly just a bit overpriced. Um, but anyway, let's open this box now and see what's in here. I haven't opened this part yet, so I'll get this little box out. You can see there, uh, made in Taiwan. If I turn it this way, I have cut the end off already, so don't want to drop it. Um, let's just pull the fork out. I'm really curious. I've actually never bought a fork before, so I don't know things like will it have the uh, crown race installed, things like that. I'm not really sure, but I'm really excited. Let's pull this thing out right now. And here, here we go. Um, I suppose I should take the bubble wrap off. I'm going to be very careful with this because I really don't want to scratch anything. And there it is. Gorgeous. Wow. Look at the number of mounts on this thing. I kind of forgot to say earlier that this um, frame really has a lot of mounts, although it doesn't have a mount at the front for a screw on mudguard, um, but it does have rack mounts, uh, dynamo mounts, uh, and three or four bottle cage mounts as well, as does this. Look at this, it has one, two, three, four, five, six screws here uh, for all your bottle cages, your rack. This fork can obviously take a rack. Um, and your bud guards, all that sort of stuff as well. And then we've got the through axle installed, and I really like that the through axle is screwed in uh, with an Allen screw and not a quick release, just because that helps with security. But I can't take the cardboard out now because I don't have an Allen key. Well, I do, but I'd have to look in a toolbox. Um, and here we have the steer tube and the crown race. Um, I suppose Fairlight probably buys these forks and then sprays them themselves. That's what I'm guessing. And we do have the crown race installed, but it is not the split ring type. It is the um, press on type. So hopefully I'll never have to <laughs> change that. I don't see why I would. Um, just something I noticed. It's not a bad thing or a good thing or anything particular. Uh, but yeah, the fork looks really nice and this is all steel as well. And um, it is a, a tapered steel as well, which is, is pretty cool. Um, yeah, it looks really great. The, one of the first videos I do is probably going to be installing the fork, although I don't have a uh, way to cut this right now. So I'm going to have to get either uh, a tube uh, cutter or probably a, a pipe cutter or probably a saw because I don't know if those pipe cutters can cut steel. Um, but that's going to be one of the first videos. Uh, but let's just go back over to the frame again and then we'll conclude this video. All right, guys. Well, that's basically it. I've got the fork here. And as you can see, the paint job on the fork obviously matches the bike. But you can also see that there is like four or five inches sticking up above the top of the steer tube here, which if you're in centimeters, that's probably like uh, 12 and a half, 13 centimeters, something like that, um, which is just ridiculous. So I'm going to have to get a saw guide before I can install the steer tube, but I'm really excited to get going. You can also see I've got all my parts laid out there behind me. I think I have everything except the tires bought. So you can see I've got some uh, Shimano, some Jaguar, and obviously my box of avocados. Just kidding, it's a box of bike parts. I'm not gonna tell you exactly what's in there, so you're gonna have to watch the videos, but I've got um, some Shimano, I've got some Data, uh, MicroShift, uh, I've got some Praxis, a little bit of hope, both in life and in bike parts. Um, and yeah, maybe I'll leave it at that for now. But uh, thanks for watching, I hope you uh, enjoy my videos. And I will be putting these videos out quite soon, probably once a week. Uh, and then we're going to throw in some other videos in between. So thanks as always for watching the channel. I hope you're doing well wherever you are in the world, wherever you are in your life. 
whatever you're up to, keep riding bikes. Let me know what you're doing in those comments. Um, and if you make videos, I'll check out your channel as well. Um, so thanks for watching and I hope you have a great day. Take care.